Hi, this is Eugene. Today we have a treat for you. Our first interview. The Who Knew podcast welcomes Paul Salamov and Matthew Jacobs. Paul has been in the entertainment industry for a number of years doing special effects and makeup to writing and directing. Plus, he also buys DVDs, so I like him already for that. Matthew wrote the 1996 Doctor Who TV movie, Young Indiana Jones, and was a child actor. Both gentlemen are fans of Doctor Who, and it shows in this interview, and we're so thankful that they took the time out to chat with us in Paul's office. We could not have asked for a better location. We'll post some pictures of this great man cave, if you will. Uh, so enjoy this special episode. Welcome to Who Knew. We are fans of the current series of Doctor Who, and here we discuss our likes, dislikes, and insights into the modern regeneration of the show. Today we have a special episode as we have our first interview. We have uh, with us today Paul Salamoff and Matthew Jacobs. I met Paul last year at LA Comic Con, and he was toting around the TARDIS <laughs> console from the TV movie, and it was just nice to uh, see that thing that I had only seen in, in the TV movie. I never thought I would actually see it in person, so I was so glad that he had it there and he was generous enough to uh, converse with me, and then now we're here talking to him again. And who else is here? Hi, this is Brian, and that TARDIS console is my favorite console out of all of them. Awesome. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to ask, let's start with Paul. Uh, how did you get introduced to Doctor Who? I grew up uh, in the East Coast uh, in Massachusetts, a town called Natick, which is actually one of the biggest sports communities of all in New England. And uh, I was one of the, one of like two <laughs> sci-fi <laughs> film geeks, was, which was not fun, of course. Um, but they're so open-minded there if you don't like oh, sports. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. And... Um, we had Doctor Who on WGBH, which was the um, PBS mm -hmm. channel. Like I stumbled upon it one day. Actually, the funny thing, I'm sorry, I'm, I know this is going to be a little long-winded, is I had seen it previously, but I didn't know what it was when I was younger. And it took me years later to figure out what exactly I saw. But I had sort of discovered it with uh, Tom Baker. And what they did, you know, in WGBH was they started with, you know, the first season of Baker and they'd show the entire season. Then when they would get a new season, they'd start all over again with Robot, go through the whole season, then you get the new ones. They'd start all over again. And then that worked mm -hmm. that way up until they got Peter Davison. So we then got Peter Davison and then they brought in, they had Pertwee and they would just so, you know, they, it, that's how I really got you know, introduced to it. And I was just became an instance of, you know, obsession with me. Nobody understood it. You know, like none of my friends were into really Doctor Who. Only a couple of people like, you know, were sort of Doctor Who fan, yeah. you know, fans. But that was basically how I was introduced to it. Nice. That's a great way for them to air it. Yeah. Because, you know, there are no VHS machines at yeah. the time or anything like that. So you got to see it over and over yeah. again. And then it just kept going, which at the time you probably didn't even knew no, there wasn't going to be a new episode next time. Yeah, and, and what was really kind of cool too is they started doing it where during the weekdays, it would be there's a single episode. Mm -hmm. On the weekends, they would show complete stories. Oh. Really? Yeah, which was really cool. Oh, like on see. Saturdays, they would show complete stories and it wouldn't be like, oh, the next story. It would be like maybe a Peter Davison one, even though we're showing Tom Baker you oh, know, okay. during the week and stuff like that. So that was actually really cool. and a smart you know, of them. Very smart. Yeah, and I used to, you know, just record everything. I, I, I think <laughs> I still have all my John Pertwee, like ones that I recorded on VHS. Man. You know, Did I, you, you ever just, audio tape? No. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. I, mean, I, I was, was I was an audio taper. Yeah. I would put the little ear plug into the portable TV yep. and put it right up against the mic. And so I still have a lot of my cassette tapes of, awesome. of, of early Star Trek episodes. It's awesome. <laughs> so Matthew, how were you introduced to Doctor Who? Well, I was brought up on it. I was um, born in the you know mid fifties in fifty six, and and uh, I suppose sixty three. I was there in Britain. Um, when it started being broadcast. Wow. So, and obviously it was a children's show mm -hmm. very much. It was on Saturday and you'd watch it after, you know, the news and the, and I think it was, I can't remember. <laughs> but then my father was an actor and he was in The Gunfighters. He played yes, Doc yes. Holliday. So in 1966, when he shot that, I was taken along to the set. I was 10 years old. It was my birthday treat. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I really became, you know, sort of part of, it became part of my life in yeah. a big way because my father was involved. Nice. Did you watch the show when you were seven or eight or? 
Um, I don't have much memories of it, to be honest. I wasn't like, I'm just uh, thinking that that's the yeah, perfect I was, age yeah, for... it's perfect age. Obviously, obviously, I I loved it. Yeah. And I and I think Troughton, probably more so than Hartnell, mm. um, because I was more of an age when I could become attached to it mm. then. Um, and then I went to you know and and I was a child actor, and so and then I got involved. So I was very much involved in the whole world. But then when I went to university, I wasn't a big Whovian. I wasn't really a big Who, Who fan. And then obviously it wasn't really until I came here and after doing Young Indie was then invited mm -hmm. to um, to write the TV movie, the 96 TV movie. And then I really got back into it all again. So when you were hired to do the TV movie, you weren't a big Whovian at that time? I wasn't a big Whovian, yeah, no. So you were just no. brought in because of... Um, I believe I heard on another interview where you... you they had seen your work from Young Indie? They'd seen my work from Young Indie. Um, the guy who was the head of Fox knew my work. Mm -hmm. um, Trevor Walton, I'd worked with him a few times, and he was also in the National Youth Theatre in Britain. So I knew him of old. Um, Spielberg and Ambling knew my work because of Young Indy. Mm -hmm. BBC knew my work because I'd done a whole bunch of stuff for the BBC so you over the years. So you basically knew almost all the parties I involved. I knew everyone except <laughs> Tom Thayer at, at, at Universal. Universal, yeah. Um, so he was the only person I didn't really know. Obviously, I was a fan of The Doctor. It was ingrained in me. Right. Um, and, I, and I did love Doctor Who and and brought all that love to the table um, when we were when we were trying to bring it back to life. Do you know what I love about this? The fact that <laughs> this is such a great thing with you know I'm in this American yeah. East Coast yes. American you're British, so you're like <laughs> literally steeped in it. Like I was just thinking, it made me think that like growing up, you know. I found out there was like a Doctor Who convention that I think was in like Rhode Island or New Hampshire or whatever, you know, and I know it was like at least an hour away and I, I convinced my dad to take me to it because I, I wanted to go to, you know, some kind of Doctor Who like yeah. event and it was so small. I can, I can still picture it. I, I built a K-9 to, you know, to, <laughs> to go to it. Like I built a couple of K-9s over my, over my years and, uh, yeah, and, and I remember I, I still have distinct memories of that. And also I remember at that there was the Doctor Who fan club. Because, you know, I was like yes. desperate to get any like, you know, there any kind no of stuff. Yeah, there's no internet or anything yes. like that. So there was a Doctor Who fan club, which I still have my card. I still have <laughs> my mom found the canceled check that I, you know, <laughs> sent to the Doctor Who and I have like a copy of that. Yeah. And I because when I was back home recently, we we're going through some stuff, I found all my issues of the Whovian Times. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah, which I have That's in amazing. my in my in my uh, closet, um, I, I haven't looked through them yet, but I had all like the the Whovian Times. I kept all of them, and then of course, you know, Doctor Who, you know, uh, magazine, you know, mm -hmm. Doctor Who Monthly and Doctor Who Weekly. I, I would just voraciously just to like yes. get any information because it was not you know really it was I think, nothing. I think in America, um, it's well, I think in Britain, Doctor Who's been around you know, since since its inception, and it's taken for granted. It's sort mm -hmm. of part of the landscape. Whereas in America, it was something you had to search out and yeah. find. And and so the, the devotion of the American fan is much stronger and I think less cynical um, <laughs> than the British fan. But then I, I don't know a lot about British fans, but, right, but right. certainly, certainly but I've come to know Doctor more about Who is American like fans. a... I mean, in Britain, isn't it like a cultural touchstone where... Even if you don't watch the show, you know what a blue call police call box oh, yes. is the TARDIS yes. and things like that. It's almost, it's almost, I would say, it's the equivalent of kind of how Star Trek is to Americans. Hmm. Yes. If you, know, if you don't watch Star Trek, you still know well, Kirk even, and Spock. And yeah. the even ship. with the eight-year gap when we put out the TV movie, it was still, I, I think, nine or ten million people who watched it oh, that night sure, yeah. in Britain in a country that's only 50 million. That's an yeah. enormous million. number. Wow. That's a lot of people to actually watch it. Mm -hmm. And then it was in the top three of the, the, the then, you know, VHS video charts for ages so so you're talking about a country that's been brought up on this and it's part of their landscape and the attitude toward people who were you know avid followers of doctor who was that um was mixed you know sometimes they were regarded as what's called anoraks which in which um is in Britain a slightly abusive term for somebody who's a geek, nerd, train spotter, 
you know, um, train, you know what a train spotter mm-hmm. is. Yeah. You know, somebody who just stands at the station with the 250 railway, railway companies and railroad companies in Britain and they'd write down the numbers of the trains as they would come and go. So a pointless activity. Right. Um, and yeah. so, so they would be regarded as anoraks. And so that was what a lot of extreme Doctor Who fans in Britain were regarded as. It's changed now, ever since the new Who, mm-hmm. um, where where the thing became sexier um, and involved, you know, people. Um, you know, uh, it was just it just became a different show. Yeah, I, I, my my jaw dropped when my daughter told me that they had a Doctor Who like club at her, you know, junior high. Wow! I'm like, what? Yes. I'm like, what? Yeah, we, it was like a cool thing too. We we won. Yeah, yeah. I guess so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the geeks yeah. finally would, got yeah, there. It would have been nice if that was a long time ago, though. Yeah, we, I agree we, too. Okay. For the uh, slings and arrows of. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, and quoting <laughs> Shakespeare really wasn't high on the list either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah that, was, uh, that was certainly tough being a, uh, an, an early adopter in <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where I grew up. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's. it's, it's, it's you know, I remember when the show first came back on, there was a lot of people who were just like, we're just, you know, this isn't our Doctor Who, this yeah. is our Doctor Who. It's like, are you kidding me? Like, when I saw Doctor Who on the cover of Entertainment Weekly magazine, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, my God, finally. I think I, I think I posted something on Facebook. I'm like, I told you! You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it was like, that was like my thing. It's like, I told you! You know, and, and that, was, that was such a wonderful thing to know that something that I truly care about and, and you know, that was being embraced by the, you know, by the greater masses. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, you know, I love it. I love that very much, actually. Uh, we also comment a lot that we like that that the TV movie. We love how the new series uses the use the TV movie as a bridge. They they incorporated a lot of what you initially set up in the TV movie. Um, it wasn't so forbidden to have a romance. Um, that the Doctor was a little bit. Well, depending on how the doctor was played, a little bit more down to earth versus alien. He was going to say human. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, he seemed half human. He is half human. <laughs> um, no, he is half and, human. And was that's that... yet to be discovered. <laughs> right. yeah. Now, for the half human. No, it's true. He is half human. Now, was that a concept that you came up with, or was it a concept? It was a concept that, the... that both um, both myself and Phil Siegel, um, especially Phil, were were very keen to bring home. But as was pointed out to me by a fan as I've been making this film, Doctor Who Am I, um, that that I may have been uh, subconsciously channeling Star Trek mm. oh. because Spock is yeah. half human. I didn't realise that at the time. Mm-hmm. But he's always seemed half human to me. Well, he certainly um, has a love for Earth th- yeah, more than any I, other planet. I think he has to keep it a dark, dark secret. Um, along with many uh, others <laughs> along with many others and maybe he doesn't even know it himself but he is um, why does he keep saving humans all the time you know why why does he have two hearts he's he's a divided soul um, and that's my feeling about the doctor um, and that was my feeling as a writer about the doctor I wasn't trying to change mythology um, I was just trying to expose something that maybe hadn't been exposed up to that time so I do think now that the doctor has become a lot more maybe hopefully not so much with the 13th but certainly with the 12th has become very self-analytical has become very self-absorbed um, and has gone, th- I think, even uh, through a strange midlife crisis yes. um, uh, where he has a electric guitar, a massive mm. crush, and sunglasses. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> um, and I think, and I think it's, and I think it's lovely. But I think it's time. For, it is time for a change. And I think with each Doctor comes a different um, manifestation mm-hmm. of this character that, in some ways, reflects its own time. Mm. Yes, when it's when it's sure, created, yeah. and and Paul's Doctor very much reflected, reflected this you know the the nineties coming out of the eighties, a sort of a flamboyance, a synthesis. I think the other show creators have been aware of this and have respected the mm-hmm. fact that Paul and Paul wasn't just the TV movie. Paul was mm-hmm. the radio show. Mm-hmm. Paul was alive for a long time right. as a doctor, um, uh, and and has and has matured as such. I think he's a 
I think I, I, you know, it was a joy to see him again recently as I got back into conventions, right? And to see how he has he recognizes the maverick nature of his doctor, mm -hmm. um, the sort of reluctant nature, the reluctant hero nature of his doctor. Um, and I think that's what marks him out as a transition. Mm -hmm. He's not as madcap as the previous doctors. Right. He's more of a hero. Uh, and Except then, about his shoes. He loves his shoes. <laughs> he loves his shoes. <laughs> well, we had a problem, you know. Right. He got out of the, the, morgue, the morgue and there were no shoes. Mm -hmm. And he was walking around barefoot, so we needed some shoes. So suddenly Brian's shoes were the shoes. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, they fit. Speaking of the 90s, there was a lot of will they, won't they shippers out there as far as relationships between TV shows like Moonlighting, uh, The X Files, Remington Steel. Yes. Did, did it have any Good influence question. on what you did with uh, the writing of that companion relationship oh. with the doctor? <sighs> Yeah, I suppose it did. I mean, I think that I think it's a really good question. That was a thing that was going on. It was always a will they, won't they. It was the only continuing story that you could keep continuing yeah. when each week would be a standalone adventure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, we, you know, would the you know on the X Files would what was their relationship was what kept you coming back to them, and I very much liked the idea that she was a doctor as well. Mm, Do you yes, see what I mean? yeah. that they were two doctors and it became a joke in you know in my household you know it was like it would be like i'd do something and my wife would say thank you doctor and i'd go <laughs> thank you doctor um <laughs> and the idea was was that was well that yeah. also goes back to uh the episode your father was in there's two and doctors he was a doctor yeah, yeah. now that was just purely so because that wasn't <laughs> i only realized that um, when I was at Long Island, who the convention there, and they would, did a special panel where they showed um, my dad's scenes in those four episodes mm -hmm. of Doctor Who. Um, and then I spoke to Peter Purvis as well, and he told me stuff that I didn't realize, which was that they had um, were having problems with Hartnell at the time. So they were shifting the emphasis away to the from, uh, from him mm -hmm. to the companion. And in fact, that's why my dad's role was so big in the yeah, gunfighters yeah. playing Doc Holliday. And there was a lot there was a lot of him. I had no idea, do you know, obviously at that time of the ins and outs were, that were going on. But so, yes, so, so seeing that, I suddenly realized, yes, it was ironic that not only had my father been in a show about the doctor in America, mm -hmm. but he'd been in the show about the doctor in America up against the doctor. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Is my and name. he had that scene where he was running down a corridor in a ball gown to Puccini playing. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's a real coincidence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it was a, it's meta. The, ca meta, the character meta. of Grace is a very strong character, which... Which you guys are friends with the actors. Very, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, Hopefully. We, we'd love that Grace was a doctor. What we always look for in a, a potential companion is somebody who, like, accepts the doctor, the world, the universe right away. Mm -hmm. And she does that. Uh, it's a, you know, bit, it's really, a bit of a struggle. A little bit of a struggle, path. but she's also, yeah. it's its very quickly where she's like, well, I meet the man of my dreams and he's from another planet. Yes. But she admits he's the man of her dreams kind of a thing. Yes. Um, <laughs> she's <you go>. accepting. <laughs> yeah, she's accepting, yeah. Well, I'll yeah. go back to the, the convention circuit because that's where I met Paul. Mm -hmm. you, were, you were carrying around, or not carrying around, but you had the TARDIS console. How did you acquire this? Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, there's a really good story here. And it's really funny because, uh, I mean, it's sort of like, you know, the Tom Baker, you know, before he regenerates, you know, like, you know, this has been set, you know, I can't even think of the exact quote, but, you know, like this has all been set up in the past, right? You know, for this moment. Um, I actually went to the premiere of the Doctor Who movie at the Director's Guild. Wow. Oh which is, yeah, which is really funny because I, I, I used to be, um, I was involved with the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films, the Saturn Awards. I produced some of the Saturn That's Awards. Right, yeah. I was their director of operations, their film moderator. Uh, and, um, you know, I went with the uh, the now president, Robert Holden. He took me to the, the premiere, which was amazing. You know, like, you know, because, you know, it's such a big Doctor Who fan. So I, I just think that's sort of a funny footnote, you know, of all the things I had gone through in my, in my life. But I was at San Diego Comic-Con and I had just 
So previously I, I had um, produced this um, horror movie and my makeup artist was from England and, but she didn't watch Doctor Who. And I would always tease her about the fact that she didn't watch, or you know, it was like a big consternation. Like, how can you be from England and not, you know, right. be into Doctor Who, which always sort of annoyed me. But <laughs> I ran into, I had just built my Dalek. I have a, we're actually sitting next to my Genesis of the Dalek uh, Dalek. I'm it to the it's left. <laughs> it's <laughs> um, to our right. Yeah, um, and, Eugene's in his gun sight. <laughs> yeah. And I had pictures of it, right? So I was very proud of my Dalek. So I'd always wanted to build a Dalek. And I ran into to her randomly in this sea of people. You know, you've obviously been yeah. to San Diego Comic Con. It's hundred thousand people yeah. or plus. So it's amazing when you can spot that one person. Yeah, or yeah. That's her so yeah, so I, I ran into her, and um, you know, she was with her, you know, her friend, and I go, oh hey, I was just thinking of you, like just being funny, like she was. Yeah, I go, I got to show you my Dalek. You know what I mean? Like you know, just like being funny. And she goes, oh, you know what's funny? I was thinking of you too. It's like you know, my my best friend's boyfriend um, has the TARDIS and wants to get rid of it. Uh, I'm like, what? <laughs> what? Those are like, words that should never be spoken. Yeah, I'm like, what, what are you talking about? Yeah, he has like the, the TARDIS and he wants to get rid of it. I'm like, I, I don't even understand what you're saying to me. <laughs> like, what do you mean has the TARDIS? Well, he like does prop stuff and he has the TARDIS. Like, wow. And I'm like, she goes, I don't know. He's going to be here like, he's going to be here like in 20 minutes or something like yeah. that. I literally grabbed her by her shoulder. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you're not going anywhere until I figure out what the heck you're talking about. Okay. And of course he was like two hours late. Ugh. Okay. But we like still hung on and he shows up. It turns out that he was the, you know, the prop company that worked on the Doctor Who movie yeah, that yeah. they built it up in Vancouver. And he said he was the thing. He's like, they had all this stuff, but they were just getting rid of it. And he just, it was taking up too much space in his shop. And it was because it was so, you know, iconic, you, he couldn't rent it out either. So not mm -hmm. only was it just, you know, he couldn't make any money off of it. And, um, you know, it was just taking up space. He goes, I just want to honestly, like, get rid of it like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, well, uh, I want to buy it. <laughs> you know, I, I want this. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and what was just crazy was that, you know, it's in Vancouver. Right. You know, because you can imagine, oh my God, how much is it going to cost us to ship, let alone buy, right? Well, as luck would have it, he was building a float for the Rose Bowl parade. And he said, I will put it on the truck and drop it off at your house. Oh, too. wow. So, like, Man. free shipping. All wow. right. And he basically sold it to me for next to nothing. That's wow. awesome. Okay. And it was like, no, it was in like, you know, it was in a little bit of rough shape. But the good news is I did special effects for, you know, 14 years. And I know how to, you know, restore build stuff and yeah. restore stuff. And I uh, also know great people who know how to build and restore stuff. So, you know, when I got it, um, you know, the one thing like the time rotor was missing. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I did was rebuild the time rotor from scratch. So, you know, used as much, um, I'd fill, <laughs> I'd fill Siegel's book you know which was awesome <laughs> and there wasn't a lot of great reference that was the thing is they didn't take a lot of pictures phil told me this too they didn't take a lot of pictures on set mm -hmm. when they when they did this so there was very little reference so you know i rebuilt that and uh and then my friends bob mitch and brian wiga got involved brian wiga is a very talented like you know like engineer and like knows electronics so we realized that it's like you know this would be a fun thing to share with the fans mm -hmm. you know what i mean because that was the thing it's like you know, it, it, as you can see, it's on a base that has wheels on it, right? But it wasn't, you know, yeah. for the longest time. For the longest time, it was just in my garage here. Uh, and I would actually allow Doctor Who fans to come and see it mm -hmm. because I wanted to share it with people. I knew what it meant to have this. I mean, that's that's the thing I always tell people. And it's like, and I'm not, you know, I'm not pat myself on the back or anything. It couldn't have gotten in the hands of a better person to have it because... It two, for twofold. Number one, I knew how to repair it right, you know, and take right. care of it and, and you know, sort of make it into, you know, a movable piece. But also, I I really understood what it meant. This is the only, this, first of all, it's one of the only remaining original TARDISes, period. Two, it's the only one in the United States, which is crazy. And, you know, it's a piece of Doctor Who history. And, you know, I just, I knew that it needed to be shared with people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it wasn't a thing like, you know, I'm not going to let people take pictures of it or I'm not going to. They're like, no. Like, I know what it means to be able to look at that thing every day. And I know what it means to touch it and to <laughs> yeah. spin the dials on it. Yeah. And I love, I love to share that with people. I love, I love to do it. I mean, as you know, I just brought it to the right. LA, you know, Comic Con just not even a couple of months ago. Yeah. Because... I, I, I love it. You know what I mean? I love to, I, and I love the fact 
that, you know, people ask me all the time, would I sell it? You know, like, would I sell this? And I was like, why? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like, I, it's not, yeah, I'm sure I could get a lot of money. For, am I allowed to swear? That's fine. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> a lot of money for it. Um, but that's, I like the fact that, you know, I'm a working professional in the industry. You know what I mean? And I own a piece of Doctor Who history. The thing that inspired me as a five-year-old child, the thing that really showed me the wonders of science fiction and, and how creative science fiction could be. You know what I mean? And it's like, why would I ever want, you know, I, I, it's it's become a part of me. And yeah. thank God, you know, with people like Matthew and Daphne and Paul and Yiji, it's like they've really accepted me as part of like their family. And mm-hmm. I'm sort of part, even though I wasn't involved with the Doctor Who movie, you know, when it was being made, they've sort of ac- accepted me as part of that that team. And I think Philip has accepted you. He's yeah. um, so kind of made you the curator of the Doctor Who yeah. um, things. Yeah, talk yes. about a funny thing with Phil. So I knew Phil through the Sci-Fi Academy, okay. right? And I'd met him years before. And then... Um, I you know knew him through original productions because you know he's a you know he's a big reality show yeah. producer and the first time we brought the console to the Gallifrey One convention he had, was a guest and he came and saw it and like it was so emotional for him because he thought it had been destroyed mm. oh wow he, he didn't know it still existed. And he certainly didn't know that I had it, which was like really like, you know, big shocker to yeah. him. Because that's usually what happens when yeah. production ends. They just yeah. trash everything. Yeah, because yes. that was the thing. Is, the next, yeah, the yeah, because that production. was the thing. That the reason why he still had it in Vancouver was that BBC didn't buy that. They built it and rented it. Really? That was a oh, whole yes. idea. They built they, it and rented they, it. They caused global warming <laughs> by building a series set that cost two million by itself. Um, you know, basically there was so much wood there building, um, all of that. It was a giant set. So they would look to save money wherever they could. Mm. And the BBC works in ways that defy logic. Sure. Um, or reason. They'll make, they'll have a hit show and then they'll hold it back for a year. I mean, what We've is, noticed that. What, what is that? <laughs> why, why would one do that? Well, speaking of that, the Doctor Who TV movie got astronomical ratings in the UK. Yes. But that was no, like, there was no way to well, use it was, that uh, to do anything with... It was in the hands of Universal. And, you know, in Universal, it was a simple choice. You know, they were, were they going to re-up sliders? Um, or were they going to take this weird <laughs> British show that they didn't understand? Mm. Um, and, uh, and so they went with sliders. And BBC, there was no particular thirst to... To yeah. um, to renovate the show at that time, I mean, and so so, you know, there's a, people throw blame around everywhere as to why things don't get picked up or mm. why people feel things like that. And and normally, you know, writers are to blame one one way or another because they're the they're the create they're the creators. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? So uh-huh. they they look to that. It's yeah, like that's where they start. it's like when yeah. you have a child that doesn't work out, you blame the parents. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so yeah. so it's a very yeah. Uh, so so yeah no. So it didn't get picked up at that time, but um, it kept alive one way. But the lovely thing about the TARDIS and the thing that when we were designing and putting together the show, mm-hmm. what I was very much after was the feeling of the of the sheer craftsmanship of the Russian spaceships. Okay. okay. Oh. Gotcha, um, gotcha. And oh. I talked about that at length with with Philip and with a designer, and we talked about, you know, so that when you look at the um, at the TARDIS there, it was like a way of saying, of liberating ourselves from from the kind of sleek um, British this or American sci-fi world. It, we wanted it to be different. And this fit very much with the sort of H.G. Wells kind mm-hmm. of Victorian sci-fi element that sort of sits in people's subconscious memory of a British, an old British TV show. Yes. So yeah, that's an American how it ended. This. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So that's how it ended up like that. The idea was the Russian, the way the Russians, and indeed the First World War dreadnought ships. Mm. Um, when yeah, you look at the ornate metalwork that goes on in those, yeah, I was just looking things. at it, and I mean, I honestly never really noticed all the times watching the TV movie the claw. Yeah, yeah. well, the here's the thing legs. about them, but more, more so about that, they're holding the planet Earth. 
Yes. Are they? Oh, they yeah. are. They're holding the planet Earth on them. That's what's Another really interesting. That's what's really interesting and something I never noticed either until, you know, officers were repairing them. Like, holy crap. That's just not like it's a ball. <laughs> that is like the planet uh, Earth. Yeah. They're yeah. beautiful. I've got all the drawings for oh, the wow, TARDIS. Yeah. I've got all of the designs. Yeah. And uh, the amount of... Have you spoken to the designer? No. no. Oh, no. we should... That's something you should do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we should. If he's still around. If he's still around. I don't know. He's, he's yeah, no, it's, it's so beautiful. The whole, but the whole console room yeah. of that TARDIS is just amazing. Yeah. Um, just all the little touches. It finally feels like something where the... Where especially Sylvester McCoy just felt so... Yeah, at home, so comfortable in it. Yeah, and, it was a shame uh, we couldn't incorporate more of McCoy because he sort of comes in and then he's gone. But it was the problem with that show, which was which was that you have this full start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. The show could start with him coming around in the hospital, mm. um, uh, but uh, but it really it really you know. But we have that beginning at the beginning, which is. You know, it's a, it's a nightmare. But, but I'll tell you, as a kid watching that, that's yeah. what got me hooked because I I came into it thinking, what is this other stuff that I don't know? What's this backstory? Yeah. Why yes. does he regenerate? Why? Yeah. What's going on? Like, why is it bigger on the inside? I wanted yes. to know more. Yes. And that's what got me hooked. I, mean, I like that through a whole pile of mysteries. The voiceover at the beginning was something that was added in post-production. Mm -hmm. That was after Universal looked at the, the cut. At the cut. And they just had no idea what on earth was mm. happening. And I was like, well, just stay to the end. Right. You know, and and then, then you'll work it out. Um, and Tom Thayer was, no, get on a plane, come down to L.A., and I will watch it with you, which was like, you don't turn that down. It's like yeah, the Godfather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm sitting there in the dark with him and he doesn't stay he just sits there in the dark and i come and sit down and he says so you're gonna write a voiceover at the beginning of this <laughs> explaining and i went okay and then and he said and that was the first time i watched it with his sort of negative i didn't understand a word of it kind oh, really? of intro so i then watched it and i then went back to the hotel wrote that opening voiceover, which I only think serves to confuse, to be honest. Mm. Um, and because, what the f*** is this guy? Who is he? <laughs> right. You know, and why are we getting, why is the doctor introducing this bit of it? It doesn't really make sense, and it really only serves to confuse. So uh, the idea was that it would be really confusing at the beginning, <laughs> and that you would then be in the same state of mind as the doctor, as he tried to work out who he was bit mm, by okay. bit. So so it was one of those things where where it was a compromise, mm. um, and it was a compromise in post production because we were racing to get it out on mm. on a schedule. We didn't have much time. I will tell you now when I do watch that, yes, knowing what I know now of the new series, yes, I kind of overlay the time war with yes that voiceover, mm. Mm. yes, which is great. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah. It was just some more. I also come up with my own theory right before we did our podcast on it because i've heard a lot of people say well the daleks wouldn't have done this you know they wouldn't have put them on trial they wouldn't have done anything like that and it was like no Why they not? might not they might have and this might have been their plan was you know we're gonna do something to the master we'll get the doctor involved and then send them off and the master's gonna create havoc that's a wonderful idea and that's it's that's very, very daleks mm. you know it's very you know cunning. because the daleks mm. You know, we we see Daleks and they're just exterminate, exterminate, exterminate. But they're really not. They have no. these long plans, and they always, you know, they'll wait centuries of and rebuilding. There's, and there's no logic. Yeah, I mean, they 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 go. Well, look at that. Right. Looking at that dialogue. <laughs> hey, be and nice. Then, be if, nice. If, if no, no, no. I mean, it's wonderful. But 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 look at it. I mean, would you really put yourself inside that inside that that thing? No, you wouldn't. Right. You'd have a far more effective. Thing to go around that maybe could go up and down stairs, yes, um, <laughs> and and maybe could do things. So yes, it, it it might be some weird kind of Dalek logic. Yeah, that's just something that, that every time I watch it, I just kind of think, okay, this was a Dalek plan. <laughs> yes, <laughs> go create havoc because he's not dead. It's the master. He's a, never going to be dead. A Dalek master plan. Yeah. <laughs> See what I did there? Yeah, See what I did there? Yeah, yeah, very good. <laughs> 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 Go 
going back to the Taurus uh, console. Okay. Uh, it was in um, when when I when I met you, you were <laughs> raising funds to restore it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. much more do you need to restore? Well, I want to get the uh, look. The dream is to get that rotor, the you know the, the them to go up the and console, down. Yeah, center just, console thing. Yeah, just to get the rotor now. No, so but it lights up, doesn't it? Yeah, it lights yeah. up. That was one of the new additions that it lights up from the top now. You know, obviously the 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 it has the TV with it, the monitor, and all the other stuff. But yeah, it's it really the dream is. But it's Brian and I have worked out different ways of doing it to make the time rotor go up and down. Um, it's just very challenging, mm-hmm. and it's going to take some time, and it's going to because there's not a lot of real estate inside. You know what I mean? Gotcha. And, it's, and yeah. it's a thing that has to be, you know, a coordination between the top and the bottom. You know, we, we've come up with a lot of different clever ideas. You know, and also we don't want to like, you know, there's ways you could do it, but you'd have to have a big pole down the center. You too much because you got to remember the way they did it in the movie was they had this whole other section that was on top of it right. that just had right. you know. You know, they had a lot of easier way to do it. They had more room. Yeah. 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 And then there's some things. Like, I, I need to, you know, fix some stuff. That rotor's taken a little, the interior, like, discs of the rotor have taken some uh, some abuse. Mm. So. And it's probably going to be really difficult to create the holographic monitor in your ceiling. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's going to be a real That's taking challenge. a little bit of time. <laughs> Which, bit of time. Was that something you came up with? Because yes. I love that. That is yeah. my favorite thing, to have a just that overhead. You could see the entire universe from inside. Mm. Wonderful. That was wonderful. Tardis. Yeah. Well, if it's bigger on the inside, you have to go all the way. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. You see everything. Yes. Yeah. That was that was a great idea. You're clever. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, speaking of conventions, Gallifrey One was just a couple of weeks ago, yeah. or last weekend, and you yes. guys were there. Mm. Yes. You care to talk about that a little bit? Like uh... this guy definitely needs to talk about it. Well, I was there um, for the since 2015. Um, Vanessa Yule. Um, who is a documentary filmmaker, and myself um, have been making a documentary called Doctor Who Am I? And I love that name. Doctor, Doctor Who Am I is really about my journey back into fandom because, as we discussed earlier, when it came out, I took the brunt of the blame as a writer, so I didn't think I would be welcome into the fan world, and I went off and did other stuff, you know, like, yeah, Bruce New Groove and others, mm-hmm. you know, other, I just got totally absorbed into other stuff. And then when the 50th anniversary came along and, and uh, Moffat brought back the doctor so that he could regenerate um, yeah. into, into the war doctor, mm-hmm. um, suddenly there was a big interest in, in, um, in the eighth doctor. I'll tell and you, I, I was, was interested when that came out. It was. I, I screamed. It wasn't that. I, I screamed as screamed. well. It was I was. Amazing. I didn't know it was going to happen. It was so, so wonderful, and he was perfect. It was wasn't still he, the same. He was still the same. I felt so emotional. There yeah. I was in my small apartment in San Francisco, you know, and suddenly this Where whole world. Where the movie world, takes place. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's meta, Matt. Um, you know, it was like everything was all folding in on itself, and. I, and, I want to interject a funny story though. Can I tell you something? When I saw that, you yeah. know, like it was called the what the, was that? the night, night of the night doctor. doctor. The night of the doctor. <laughs> so I'm watching it, and he's just about to go into the TARDIS. And now I know that the BBC did not contact me <laughs> and borrow my TARDIS <laughs> in order to shoot something. Uh, and I'm thinking, what, what's, what's going to happen when they go and say, like, they, they know I have this. Why yeah. didn't they call me? And I would definitely have let them borrow. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. and then he doesn't go inside. Yeah, right. right and right. I'm like, like, but like yeah. my heart was like starting it was to like sing. Pounding. Yeah, it was like pounding because it's your, like your console is cheating on you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> that was right, really funny. Sorry, sorry. I just wanted to. I tried yeah. to interrupt, but no, no, that's funny. <laughs> anyway, so I started getting invited to conventions, some really weird conventions, by the way, um, and then Sean Lyon invited invited me and I and at that point Vanessa said you know this is a this is an interesting story because we made films together we've made a few other films um and uh, um and so she so she, we thought we'd come along and we'd shoot the first Gallifrey convention in um, in 2015 we finished that and we realized there was a bigger film there mm. not just of my journey but this whole world you know people like Paul people like Daphne are still very involved in it and 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 it's so such a rich world 
Um, and so we decided to make a documentary about that. And we've been feeling our way through it for the past couple of years. And now we're in a state where the cut is really strong, I mm. think. Um, and we took it to Gallifrey One a couple of, you know, last week. Mm -hmm. And we played it for a room full of fans. And we tested it properly, you know, gave te out tests, got massive scores, you know, like oh, up great. in the eighties, nineties for everything, and so it so it was um, really worth doing, and and some interesting feedback. And now what we're doing is we're taking putting together what's called a sales deck for the entire movie, and where we've got the film, we've got a sizzle, we've got. Good. We've got the 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 feedback. We've got budgets, everything, and then we're going out to the key distributors of this kind of genre documentary. Yeah. But it's not so much about the genre. It's really about a, one of the fans summed it up very well. She said what she thought it was about was about being in love with something, having that love rejected in a way, <laughs> then great. coming back and and the joy of realizing. Um, that that love is still there. Yes, and she caught that arc of the story, and that's a universal story. So it's we're like very excited. <laughs> yeah. And the prequels. Well, it's like most stories. <laughs> but it, but it's, it's really a very... It's a, it, she caught that very well. And when we played it for the fans, it was great because they were, they were big laughs. Oh, and good. then people were quite moved. Um, and then there was, a, you know, a happy ending. Yeah. So, so it's been worth it. And, and Vanessa Yule is a wonderful documentary filmmaker and she really knows what she's doing. And so, so it was great, especially as an editor. And she's been the one who's really been pulling the editing together over these past couple of years. And we've just been really going it all over the country, you know. That's terrific. I mean, I, I got to, I was it. lucky enough to see it, um, you know, yeah, your screening you a month ago. Pre, yeah. yeah, yeah, the pre, yeah. It's, it's wonderful. There was, uh, there was layers of it that I was not uh, anticipating. In yeah, I mean, I'm so biased, but, <laughs> but, not, not, but not, I mean, really, honestly, as being as unbiased as possible, just because, you know, I love movies and I love documentaries, there's some really wonderful layers to it that I was not anticipating that, it, yeah, and it does get emotional at times. Yeah. It's really, it's very touching, and it's like the, your relationship with your father and so forth, um, it, it's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful documentary. I mean, it really is. It's interesting, and since you saw it, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's better. You know, oh, well, I didn't know you we, really no, we did a recut after because uh -huh. we got a bunch of notes from there, yeah. and we and we, you know, it sagged a bit in the middle, mm -hmm. and and uh, so we got rid of that. So it just goes like. <laughs> No. Awesome, good, good. No, yeah. I, I look forward to seeing now those are in the that. deleted DVD extra yeah. scene. <laughs> we we shot so much, you know. You do when you're doing a documentary. We had we really everybody who we interviewed, we could make a separate little film about. <laughs> I mean, I think that happens with documentaries, sure. Um, but very much so with this one because we didn't really know where we were going. Mm -hmm. So we were we were asking people deep and wonderful questions about themselves. And when I first cut it together, um, I it. it I did it more or less like a little mini series where there would be like 20 minutes about Tardis Tara, there'd be 20 minutes about Paul, mm. there would be 20 minutes about people and their individual stories. But at the end of the day, we decided the more interesting story was my reluctant yeah. journey because I actually wasn't, you know, I mean, I decided I wasn't a fan mm. when I came back into mm. the, to this fan world. So it's really yeah. about me becoming a fan again. Did you feel that way because of the reaction from the TV movie? We were wondering, as you watch it, it was Universal, um, Amblin, the network, Fox, um, and the BBC. Yes. Well, were not you being so much pulled, Amblin? Not so much Amblin? Yeah. But were you, were, was there a lot of notes and, and, oh, you must have this from classic Doctor Who, oh, you must leave this out from Doctor Who? Um, were you yes. being pulled in many different directions? Yes, there was a um, basically quite a few writers had tried prior to me, mm -hmm. um, and there's a book called The Nth Doctor. Oh, really? Um, about all the other writers' attempts at, at I, putting I actually, it together. Actually, you know what's interesting? So, in one of the effect shops I worked at, one of our designers was working on one of the earlier ones, and he knew that I, I was, and he showed me like some of the Cybermen. Yeah. And some of the Dalek stuff, that weird like tribal. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. saw some of that. I saw some of that stuff, and I was like, "Oh, 
<laughs> it's well, like, <laughs> this is not, you know. Well, I hadn't seen any of the previous scripts. That was the whole, I, yeah. my agent wouldn't let me in the room if if that was that. So, so, and I was with ICM at that time. And so when I went in, I pitched fresh. And the deal was, after I pitched, the deal was, well, if Matthew pulls this off, then he picks up a co-producing credit as well and serves as a co-producer. So I was like a weird, weird-ass diplomat. You know, I'd be flying back and forth to London because I understood um, the BBC at that time in the 90s because I'd been working for them on other stuff. I understood Fox and I understood um, and I understood Ambling. Oh, I understood the ethos behind Ambling, at least. And I got on well with Philip. And so, so I picked, so you're dead right. It was a case of push and pull from, especially when people started spending money. The minute people start spending money, Everybody has an opinion, <laughs> right? It's got to be daunting. I mean, it's like in in you know, I, I got to write um, last year. I wrote a short trip, so the BBC uh, Big Finish audio, you know, and I finally, you know, because I've been bothering Nick Briggs forever, <laughs> and he finally like threw me a bone, which is great. And the funny thing is, and, and I never as a writer, I never get like writer's block, right? And when I sat down to start writing, you know, the, you know, I decided I could do whoever I, so I decided to do a fourth doctor in Sarah because obviously that was my doctor. Mm -hmm. That was my companion, you know, but you know, realizing that you can't like screw around, you know what I mean? Like you've got to like, it's like, can I actually do that? You know, it's like, yeah, you know, yes. be careful what you wish for. Right. You know what I mean? It's like the, the weight of it really came crushing down. Like when I realized that like, holy <laughs> shit. Can I even write dialogue for the fourth time? Like, can I yeah. even do? Can I even pull this off? And there was that really a lot of doubt because you know, even though it's just a short story and you know, and it's just an audio thing, it's still to me, it's like, all right, well, here's my one and only. You know, this could be my one and only chance to write a Doctor Who, yeah. you know, thing. Absolutely, and I'm it's so like, glad you did that. I mean, oh yeah, because it is this thing. Yeah, that you have to. For me, it was it was at first incredibly daunting. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, am I going to be able to do this? And then I sat down and just decided I am going to enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I am going to enjoy yeah. the liberation mm -hmm. that the doctor brings because he has a scatological sense of humor. Yeah. And, you, and I think every writer who writes the doctor brings their own um, particular... Um, sense of humor to the table yeah. he's a very like you were saying about about Daphne about that it's a f it's very much a show about acceptance mm -hmm. um, it's not a show about fighting or conquering um, it's a show it's very it's a very witty show it was originally aimed for children and we've got to remember that the ethos behind doing something for children and i've worked for jim henson and i've worked for disney and things the ethos is to build some kind of um spiritual generosity hmm. Hmm. um and that's what's behind the doctor and i think and i think that's what marks the doctor out from other tv shows or genre shows mm. which are really about don't be afraid about death yeah. because yeah. you could right. be a monster or you can live forever well, you, um, you know what's interesting thing about doctor who you know i know it's sort of like dovetailing back to the beginning about you know how we got into doctor who but i think the thing that I because you know my other little obsession growing up was it was a show called Star Blazers. It was an yes, animated show, which is right. Space Cruiser Yamato. Yeah. You know, yes. for anybody else in the world. Okay, so I was uh, like equally obsessed with that, right? And I think the reason was was because I was seeing different storytelling than from American, you know, this American yes. point of view. Which like, when that. you watch GI Joe, you know, like when the Cobra ship explodes, somebody comes out in a parachute. Well, in Doctor Who. Characters were dying. You know what I mean? Like characters were actually dying. Yeah. You know, and same thing with Yamato. You know, with uh, Star Blazers. Mm -hmm. Characters, main characters who cared about died and didn't come back. Right. You know what I mean? There and, were consequences. Yeah, there were consequences to action, and it was like I think that was the thing I, I really gravitated toward Doctor Who. It's like, oh wow, there's real stakes here. You know what I mean, there's right. real stakes, and it's like people, you know, characters are dying, and like there, you know, like and and it was like, wow, this is. It was so eye-opening to me to see like this, you know, these different types of storytelling. And I think I've always, you know, sort of gravitated towards, 
you know, um, stories that were a little to the left of center anyways. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, even, you know, with the movies I I love and, you know, admire, like I I was just talking to you guys about, you know, like I I rewatched Blade Runner 2049 for the third time last night and I just saw Annihilation the other day. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, these might not be everybody's cup of tea, but I love both of those movies like I, I, when I was watching 2049 again last night I was like I fucking love this movie I love this movie I love this movie and and I've been Blade Runner is my favorite movie of all time and if anybody was going to be like nitpicky about this sequel mm-hmm. you know what I mean it's mm-hmm. like this movie is everything I love about filmmaking you know what I mean and that's the thing with Doctor Who it's like well, I everything think, I love about storytelling I think you hit on something very pertinent there well, because it's it's like when we came to do the TV movie, the option of bringing Grace, um, you know, and Chang Lee back to life um, was something that that the network, the, the American network, said, "Well, you can bring him back to life. That's going to be great, of course." And and both Philip and I was was sitting there saying. Mm-hmm. Please, mm. and I was trying to find all mm. sorts of weird things that yeah. could that could justify it, um, uh, you know. And it's there in previous drafts, and Russell, um, you know, has written about it. Um, that you know that we did find a way through the through the thread, but at the end of the day, they should have just died, you mm. know. I mean, it, it, and the doctor should have had to have gone on. But we wanted to keep that we wanted to keep that option open, yeah. and have them come back. But it always was cheesy, and there was no way around it. You know, it's an American thing. It is an but, American. Uh, yes. and that, an, that, that moment feels very American. It does, yeah. doesn't yeah. it? Oh, and yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it yeah. You know, it's an American thing that you don't want people to die. Right. Mm. For yeah. some reason, Americans aren't allowed to die. <laughs> no. Although I do have to say, I, I always laugh <laughs> that the doctor is in America for about thirty seconds. And gets three bullets pumped <laughs> into him, and <laughs> well, you know like, that's, when... such, that, I mean, that's such a welcome to America. <laughs> well, we had to pull a lot of the gunfire out of the British broadcast because it happened after that horrible shooting mm. um, that the... changed the law yeah. oh, up, really? in, up in up um, in Scotland. Dun- Dunblane, Dunblane yeah. shooting had just happened. Oh. If I remember rightly, yeah. I hope you maybe fact check that. But I think it was the dumb Blaine shooting. It was some shooting, and it meant that we literally had to go in there and take out most of the gunfire, mm. so that when it was broadcast in in Britain, he comes out and there's just one shot mm. that 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 kills him. So, um, but there you there you go. Yes, but it doesn't. They must have, but it, Grace does. Yeah. She <laughs> the only companion going. to ever kill the doctor. <laughs> You're right. She yeah. kills him. And she kisses yeah, him. Yeah, because she's looking for the heart. Mm. Yeah. She's trying to figure out what's yeah. going on. She gets in lost. And, yeah. Yes, and he's saying, don't do it, don't do it. And she's doing it. Yeah, and it, he gets shot. He gets an American companion, and the companion kills him. <laughs> what did you do with your do- with the doctor, Paul? Oh, what my story? You your story? Oh, it takes place yes. in a jumble sale. Which in is a really, jumble sale? Yeah, yeah, which is, you know, I, I yes, and, and they love the idea that it's like, oh, that's very British. You know what I mean? And actually, my story winds up being the origin of the hat rack in the TARDIS console. Oh, really? Yeah, I just thought it's nice. like, oh, I thought that was a kind of a fun, like, <laughs> that's really what the story's about, but you don't realize it like, to the end of it. But yeah, it's it's basically, um, I had an idea for, it's funny, you know how you, know, you, you have ideas for, for movies and stuff yes. like that? I had an idea for a Hellraiser movie like years ago that I, that I was pitching that never went anywhere. And I sort of lifted like the conceit of it for uh, the story, which the idea that somebody had an interdimensional like portal and they were stealing stuff from other like dimensions right. but they steal the wrong thing oh, okay right. and he's selling like, the it, like jumble sale. yeah selling a jumble sale and the doctor knows what this thing is and knows it's dangerous and basically it's like this this node thing that um monsters it's part of their procreate it's part of their procreation so it's <laughs> it's like a mating thing oh. so it's like it's very dangerous for this thing to be because these things will come to it you know what i mean it's, mm-hmm. it's how they, it's so he just needs to get it back but he also wants to know how this guy got it because mm-hmm. it shouldn't be here. You know what I mean? So uh, that was sort of I won't you know won't ruin the story. But yeah, <laughs> no. But the original concept was the the Hellraiser concept, which I always loved, right. was that somebody got one of the puzzle boxes and you know it opens a portal to hell and they were stealing stuff from hell. Ah. And Pinhead <laughs> gets upset about it and you know like oh, they right. steal yes, the wrong yes. thing and Pinhead comes after them. Oh, I thought gosh. that was like a kind of cool concept. Like it was like yes. a, kind of a neat. You know, I'm sure that'll wind up as 
you know, somewhere. One of them. <laughs> but you know, I thought it was a kind of an interesting idea. You know what I mean? Like stealing. You know, when you get something that's so amazing, but you wind up using it for like thievery. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like for personal gain, instead of like, wow, you've got a portal to another dimension, yes. and he's stealing stuff from <laughs> it. <laughs> so I always thought that was kind of kind of cool. So yeah, so that's my. Yeah. It's called collector's item. It's like a short trips one that was like an exclusive, but I think it'll be like when they have their collection. It just came out like a couple of months ago. Oh, okay, so, or, that's good. That's... So short trips on Big Finish. Yeah, it's one of the short one of the short collector's item. That's the the, the name of it, collector's item. Yeah, I, I I love it, and and it's not Tom Baker reading it, but it's this guy who does a Tom Baker that is so uncanny, it's ridiculous. Oh, right. Like at first, I thought it was like when I was like, oh my, oh my god, you know, like, I was lose my mind. But the guy is amazing, and uh, it's really wonderful. I couldn't be happier. They gave me like very few notes too, which was really amazing. That's yeah. good. But it was it was very you know very uh, wonderful experience to be able to do. It was my whole life. You know, wanting to just somehow be involved. You know what I mean? I always yeah. joke with my with my you know agents and managers. You know, because I'm a writer producer, and I always tell them like the whole reason I'm doing any of this stuff is so one day I get to do something on Doctor Who. And it was funny because <laughs> I was just talking to I ran to Rachel Talalay at uh, yes. you know, I hadn't seen her for years because I knew her through the Sci Fi Academy, and I was joking. I'm like. I'm so I, I told I told Rachel I'm like I'm so happy every time I see your name directing an episode because you're an American. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, you're yes. a great director. You're doing amazing. Your episodes are amazing. But the fact and I go keep crushing it because it's like that means that maybe one day they'll let this stupid American yeah. direct it, you know <laughs> direct an episode. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so thank you Rachel Talley for being a trailblazer for us Americans <laughs> and women, I guess. Well, yeah. well, <laughs> should should mention that as well, <laughs> female directors, which are important. <laughs> when you mentioned GI Joe and the, the parachutes mm-hmm. dropping out, like Larry Hama, the guy that wrote all the comics and the the bios, even said that it was socially or morally corrupt to not show the consequences of death in a war mm-hmm. series. Yes, series. Yeah. So I think what you said just reminded me of like why I like Doctor Who as well. Mm. It shows the consequences of things. So we've talked about the background of both of you, like writer, actor, producer. Do you care to talk about like your special effects, uh, work that you've done? Like I know you did um, Starship Troopers 3. Yeah, well, it's a pretty, I was a producer, producer on that. Yeah. Yeah, was a pretty, um, well, I mean, like, I, I was, so I've been in the business for, it's getting close to 30 years at this point, which is crazy. Um, but yeah, I did makeup effects for the first 14 years of my career. I, I worked on over 40 films, ranging from, like, Roger Corman and, like, Full Moon stuff to, uh, like, ba- I worked on, you know, Batman Returns and Batman and Robin, and I worked on Adaptation and Ed Wood and a lot of the Farrelly mo- Brothers movies, like right. Something About Mary and Me, Myself, and Irene, you know, up to stuck on you so that was funny you know and i in just had a really wonderful experience doing that but you know it was you know i did that for like 14 years but i i just loved writing like for mm-hmm. me it's like you know matthew would tell you it's just you know when you want to just i just love writing i love telling stories it's always been about storytelling mm-hmm. for me um and you know i, I started producing and um and even became an executive. I was vice president of production for Bold Films for for a while. You know, they did Nightcrawler and Drive and stuff like that. And um, but it was always about writing. So, you know, and and I just you know I just wrote and directed my first feature, which you know we just um, which we're selling right now. And um, and I'm very proud of it in the sense that it it is definitely influenced by my love of Doctor Who. I, I get some Doctor Who references in there, but it's mm-hmm. not... That's just really for me and like for anybody who notices. But it's really the Doctor Who references is more of like the the idea that storytelling can be, you know, can go to places where you're not expecting. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, it, mm-hmm. and it's like Doctor Who has been such a, a huge influence on me just as far as opening my eye, eyes to different types of storytelling, w- which I love. So my movie's called Encounter. I might as well plug it. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, sure, absolutely. It's called Encounter, and it stars uh, Luke Hemsworth and you know from West, Westworld, and obviously he's Chris and Liam's brother. Um, but it has uh, Anna Hutchinson from um, Cabin in the Woods. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got Cheryl Texiera from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and uh, Tom Atkins, you know, who you got to love from... Uh, you the know, 80s. Yeah, the 80s, John <laughs> Carpenter days, and like, The Fog, and Halloween. Three and lethal of course, weapon. you know, Hunsacker from yeah. Lethal Weapon, 
and he's really amazing in the film. So it's, you know, but it, it's, you know, it's a science fiction movie like Arrival or, or like Annihilation, mm -hmm. you know, in the sense that it's a science fiction of ideas, like what Doctor Who is. It's it's the science fiction of ideas, which is really important to me as a, as a creator and as a writer, even writing comic books and graphic novels and stuff like that as well. Anything well, else to add to like your history of stuff? No. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> I have one quick, one quick no. little question. Huh? You oh, wouldn't see that the TV movies referred to as the enemy within? Yeah, what? I don't know why that is. Why you is don't that? know? Yeah, we no. can't figure that out. That didn't, that was a, that was the title that that um, Philip gave it. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, and uh, I don't know what the what it means, really. Yeah. It was a the reference enemy... to, to him. That's, the, the, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's right, it's me. Uh, it's, no. you. it's you, Matthew. It's, it's, it's you, Matthew. I was the I'm enemy. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> that would make sense, actually. But I think, no, I have no idea. Yeah. I think it. he wanted to, to, we just wanted to call it, Doc, I just wanted to call it Doctor Who. Because people didn't really know what that what that was, you mm -hmm. know, and so. But I suppose there's a that's a good title, yeah. And but I ended up on. making Doctor Who Am I, which is what I would have called it if I, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because it, it because really it's a film about search for identity, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so so. Um, I just have to ask: in uh, Batman and Robin, did you have anything yes. to do with uh, like touching up of the bat nipples? Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I, 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 I actually I worked on. It's uh, too early. Yeah, I, I worked on Poison Ivy's uh, big flower bed okay. and some of the frozen. I did make the the, the frozen dog and the uh, the hair work on the frozen dog that takes a piss on the fire hydrant. That's <laughs> one of my more prouder moments. A lot of animals. For you Star Trek fans, actually, you know, I, I did a replica of Portos in Star Trek Enterprise. Oh. You know, his dog. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that, there's an episode called A Night in Sick Bay where the dog oh, gets sick. sick. Yeah. So I built the, uh, I did all the oh, hair really? work on the, it's actually one of my, because it, it looks, that, you look at my portfolio and it's like, that looks just like, looks like a real dog. I mean, it's it's pretty. What's Wow. Great. That's yeah. great work. Thanks. That, Thanks. Looked exactly yeah. like the. Well, I did like, the dogs and there's something about Mary also. Oh, that's what, you know, okay. So the dog and the cast and <laughs> yeah, stuff the like ca that. I was going to say the cast is probably. Yeah. Right yeah. yeah. So I've worked on, and that's the fun thing is like, you know, it, it's just so. <laughs> It's just so funny, you know, how small of an industry it is and how small, like, and just like the adventures you have, you know, your, your career, like, you know, I worked on Critters 3 and 4 and the star of Critters 3 was Leonardo DiCaprio right. and the star of Critters 4 was Angela Bassett, mm -hmm. you know in what space. I mean? And it's like, yeah, in space, exactly. And it's just like, you know, and I worked on Children of the Corn 4, which had Naomi Watts in it. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. you just like never know. You never know, yeah. Yeah, you just like never know where, and, and it's really funny because one of the companies that's interested in um, potentially distributing my movie the he one of the principles of it is one of the um producers of brian singer's first movie public access mm -hmm. which i actually bid on the make of effects for and i still had my bid <laughs> yeah. and i brought it to the meeting i showed him he was so <laughs> delighted to see it it was actually like typed i think it was like not even typed on a computer i think it was like typewriter. literally typed on a typewriter yeah yeah something like, yeah, something like <laughs> you know, on a typewriter or something like that um and uh you know just so funny i mean like you know that was what like <laughs> 20 i mean like how long ago that's like almost 27 years ago mm -hmm. you know and it's just so it's just so funny i mean like I, yeah yeah the same, well it's kind of the same thing happens on where eugene and i kind of do the same bit of work mm -hmm. and the people who do the war work we just shuffle around the studios yeah yeah you yeah. know it's like okay right. you're over for a while then you're then you're and we all know each other. It's still the same work. Right. <laughs> it's just, and sometimes it's even the same clients. <laughs> same vendors, too. Right. But, yeah. I mean, like, think, but think how, like, weird it is that Matthew and I, you know, like, we are good friends. I mean, we're, actually, Matthew was yeah. very instrumental in helping me with my movie. You know, like, he was one of the first people I showed it to. But, I mean, you know, he just doesn't live that far from me. Daphne lives right up the street. Everybody lives. You know what I mean? It's, 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 yeah. I, I'll tell you a crazy story. small just, world. Yeah. yeah I'm going to tell this story just because I love this story. And it's a Doctor After Who story. All. Okay. So, John Levine. Do you guys know who John Levine is? You know. Like he's Sounds Sergeant similar. Benton. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah, yes. Sergeant Benton. Okay. Yeah. Back when you would actually print out scripts, right? There's this place, you know, I still Burbank. Do. Maybe that's why yeah. I'm not getting any. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's this place, a color copy and print. I'm going to give them a shout out. Jeff Whitehead, who runs a place. I love mm -hmm. them. They're great. They have great prices and great work. Uh, I was in there. I was in there to, to photocopy like a script or something like that. And they said it was going to be a little bit of time. So I just needed to sit down. So I would sit down and in walks, you know, this older gentleman. Okay, and you know, I look at him. I'm just sitting at the counter. I look at him, and you know, they tell him, "Oh, it's gonna be a couple minutes." He puts some stuff down on the. He puts some pictures down on the table, and he goes to sit down. And I'm like looking over, and I'm like, 
No. I'm like, he, no. He works for Unit. No, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm like, like, no, this is impossible. You know what I mean? Like, this is absolutely impossible. <laughs> and I just keep on like looking over at him, and I'm like, and, and I got no, like, I got no shame. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm, I'm about to, like, not, you know, I paid for my thing, and I'm, I'm about to, like, go, and I look and see what the stuff he put on the counter, and there's a picture of John Pertwee there. So clearly, you know what I mean? Boop, mm-hmm. boop, boop. You know what I mean? Like, so I turn, I'm like, um, excuse me. I go, um, are you John Levine? Why, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. I, mean, I literally, like, literally freaked out. Now, mind you, I've worked with some pretty big celebrities, you know, right, over the course right. of my career, okay? I have never flipped out before. <laughs> like, it's since Sergeant Benton was sitting there. And, you know, I sounded like a complete lunatic. And it's funny, at the time, I think I was an executive or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, I just sounded like a complete lunatic. But the, the point being is that it's like, because it meant something yes. to me. Do you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. it meant, and, and John actually turned out, you know, he's m- thus moved back to, you know, England, but he lived down the street. You know what I mean? And he would come over here from, and he would call me all the mm-hmm. time about things. You know, I get these weird random phone calls. Paul, I've got something I need to talk to you about. And like, <laughs> and, and like a funny story is like, um, Noel Clark, you know, plays mm-hmm. Mickey. He's one of my really close friends. And when I went to England to visit Noel, <laughs> John like gave us like a, gave me a list of stuff he wanted me to bring back and I, I didn't know what half the stuff was so <laughs> Noel helped me buy the stuff and I'm like is this the craziest story ever I got a new companion and, and I actually had to put them on the phone together and it's like I have bridged the gap between new and old who myself me I did this you know what I, mean? like, I put That's Mickey fantastic. on the phone with Sergeant Benton you know what I mean and it's like that means something. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? It means something to, you know, it just, you know, for the same reason, it means something to own that. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And it means of the world to me that this gentleman sitting next to me on the couch is a friend of mine. I mean, and it's like, it, it's it, it's wonderful. And I think that's yeah. what makes us all wonderful. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And it does, yeah. it does. It's just lovely. That's what I like about American, the American fandom. It's so mm-hmm. inclusive. You know what I mean? And everybody here is very, very friendly. Mm-hmm. You said earlier that you thought we were less cynical than the British. Yes. How 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 are they cynical towards it? It's they made it cynic. Yeah. They they there's a tendency in in Britain where familiarity breeds discontent. Oh, okay. Um and uh, and so you'll you'll end up with an attitude that that you know a compliment might be well it could have been worse. Mm. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, the Irish do that. Didn't they? That's right. That's how he's going to conclude this. By the way, this is how he's going to conclude this podcast. That's I'm right. going to tell you how great a time I had. He's going to tell. Well, this could have gone could've a lot worse. worse. <laughs> well, that's not half okay. bad. Yeah. 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 So tell us how we can find Doctor the, Who. The project I? you're working. On. Yes. Well, not yet. Because, well, how can we support well, it then? Well, you can be a part of it, um, and I would appreciate this. Um, if people go to the Facebook page, Doctor Who Am I, um, and like the page. Because it makes a big difference. <laughs> it makes a big difference for, as distributors are looking at it for them to see that there's over a 1,000 people already who want to see it, um, even with no real publicity. So the more people who like the page at this time, the better. Good. Mm, so certainly that's how people can help. And also when you go to the Facebook page, there's a lot of little clips on it um, from the film. And um, and this, and uh, bit by bit, hopefully, before the end of the year, we will be um, surfacing with the film. But we're trying to get a distributor attached before we start hitting festivals. And we're trying to initially at least go beyond the um, genre festivals to to try some of the some of the festivals where some of my other films like Boxing Day and mm. and Bar America and Paper House and all of those films have played really big festivals like you know you know Venice and Toronto mm. and and Sundance and things so I'm certainly gonna try and we're gonna try and, and see if see if we can get it as wide as we can um, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, Paul, where can we find uh, Encounter? Uh, well, that is to be determined. We actually okay. had a successful Berlin Film Festival. So actually right now we're talking to a bunch of interested distributors. So hopefully cool. in the next couple of weeks we'll know some stuff, nice. which will be good. Um, but yeah, so uh, but you can check it out on IMDb. There's um, 
a bunch of pictures up from it and there's actually a Facebook page and there's a uh, beyond casual media website has uh, they're one of the producers. Um, they have information. So we'll be making announcements as we, as we have it. Are you going to be taking the TARDIS yeah. console anywhere else? Um, I don't know. That's to be determined. I know the next convention I'll be at will be WonderCon, but just as a guest. Oh, I'll be there as well. <laughs> yeah, so I'll be there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't know. It, it's you know, it's, it's so funny. I mean, it's been to New York. It's been to Oklahoma. It's wow. been to you know, it's been to San Diego. It's been to you know, L.A. Um, I want to go to Chicago sometime. I'm always telling Chicago Tardis, please have me. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know if there's anybody, any conventions out there listening that want to have the Tardis console, just get in touch with me. Maybe. The winds will blow in that direction in Chicago. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> uh, so, so to wrap it up, can you guys think of any classic or new Who episodes that you would like to recommend to anybody that wants to be introduced into the show? I th I was very impressed by Blink. Okay. Yes. Um, and I've always felt as though. You know, if 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 I'm if people are saying watch the show, you know, it certainly gets your interest, mm. and then you go and find out other stuff. And then obviously, the TV movie, I don't really, I it, TV movie is served as an intro for a, a lot of people, um, and could be a good intro in terms of looking back as well as looking forward. But I, th but Blink is the um, if I was recommending somebody to get going now. As a writer, do you look at Blink and go? It's. I think it's the best thing he did. Yeah, I um, agree. Oh, yeah. And um, oh, yeah. I think he got a little, you know, like I said earlier, sort of the doctor gets a bit self indulgent after yeah. that. But but it really, you know, is I think I thought it was very good. Yeah. And there's other stuff. I mean, I I mean, generally, there's so much of it out there that I think you would make up your mind depending upon the person you're talking to. That's a good point. You'd say... You'd we always say, say that, too. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to go along with him, I would Blink is the one that's sort of like the cool factor, like, okay, you want to see how cool the show can be? Mm -hmm. You know, but, I mean, obviously Rose is a good intro yes. to the series. Right. But, yes. I mean, like, if you're going to look into classic Who, I mean, I always try to start people off with Tom Baker just because I think... Um, but if you're going to pick a Tom Baker one, even though Genesis of the Daleks is my favorite, favorite Tom Baker one I say Pyramids of Mars is like almost the best one because in a sense it's yes. almost like a soft reboot of this because the beginning of the episode sort of fills you in on everything you need to know about Doctor Who right. you know at this in this like moment which is I don't know why it's even there you know he has this conversation with Sarah and he's yeah. like saying oh you know I walk in infinity you know like that and it's so it almost like not only is it one of my favorite stories but it also kind of like reintroduces the character yes, for some odd good. reason. That's you're a good, right. You know that's what a mean? very good point. So I that's thought why, of that one. Yeah, that's it's good. odd. It's, but it's and so changed my choice. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, it's, a, it's a good solid four parter. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's a great performances. And yeah, it, I think that's better than Blink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Too late. I already had it. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> Well, thank you to Paul and to Matthew for taking their time out and uh, for inviting us to this wonderful man cave, if you will, awesome, awesome. of uh, Doctor Who and sci-fi memorabilia. This is amazing. And congratulations on your yeah. first uh, successful interview oh, here. Thanks. <laughs> Certainly could have gone a, the word successful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly could have gone a lot worse. Uh, oh, you're British. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. This was a wonderful thank interview. You very, much. very good. Thanks for listening. We will see you next time when the future becomes the present. You've just listened to an episode of Who Knew? Our wonderful theme music is by Michael Grady. Find him on Facebook at The Universe Explodes. All our episodes are engineered by our very own Auburn. Find me at auburnbinkley.com. You can find this show in several places. Follow us on Twitter at Who Knew Podcasts. Subscribe, review, and listen to us on iTunes and Stitcher. Or our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Who Knew Podcast. All our episodes are on Who Knew Podcast.com. You can leave comments there or email us at Who Knew Podcast at gmail.com. This podcast is inspired by Doctor Who, the longest running sci fi show in history and especially the revival spearheaded by Russell T. Davis. Thanks to Russell, Sidney Newman, Verity Lambert, Ron Grainer, and all those involved in the adventures of our favorite Time Lord. Your work continues to inspire and entertain.